Welcome everyone, Living Word Worship Center, Wednesday night Bible study. God bless you all, thank you for coming out. What a beautiful evening, what a wonderful place here, so nice and cool. Amen. <laughs> Full of good people, and uh, welcome you guys watching on the internet here. God bless you and thank you for being part of our family. Uh, let me begin the service with just a couple of announcements. We have a big weekend. Uh, we don't have little weekends or little anything. <laughs> but uh, so this coming Sunday, uh, July 7th, at our 11 o'clock service, uh, it's first Sunday of July, so we have a communion service as we typically do. And I uh, just want to make note of this, let others do what they want, this is what we do. Uh, we serve the Holy Communion, and uh, no one is turned away from the Lord's table. It's none of my business what other people do, that's fine by me. If they want to screen people, that's fine. But uh, it's an open invitation, everyone. Period. And uh, the worse shape you're in, the more important it is you be here. The more guilty you feel, it's just for you. This is not for the righteous. <laughs> the righteous are already ahead. But I'm kind of making light of it, but I'm not kidding. This is, this is the Lord's table and everyone is welcome. I encourage everyone. There's not a person that I know of, there's not a person that I wouldn't that I wouldn't drink together with and eat together at the Lord's table. Let other people do what they want. That's what I do. Okay, also, that's uh, at the conclusion of the service there on Sunday uh, at around uh, 1230 or maybe just a little before, we're having a water baptism service and I think... Uh, we have several people, I'm not sure how many, you never really know how many until the day comes. <laughs> but uh, it's gonna be a great day and a beautiful service, beautiful, nice, warm, sunny day. And, and uh, so we're having water baptism at the end of the service there. The water baptism, as is the communion, no one will be, not, be denied the waters of baptism. If you wanna, if you wanna be baptized, you profess your faith in Christ, you want to be baptized, I'm your man. I love you. you don't owe me nothing. <laughs> you don't even have to answer a question unless you want a certificate, and that's all the information we want from that. But uh, So I am kind of making light of it, but I want you to feel comfortable, anyone. If you're not comfortable coming to the house of God, uh, I mean, after all, that is the point. The idea is not to see how many people you can keep away, but to see how many people you can invite. Yes. And uh, so we certainly are glad to be serving communion to whoever, everyone who desires it Sunday. Also, we'd be baptizing. It'd be a beautiful service then. Also, um, on August 4th, we're now four weeks from this Sunday. So we're getting closer, of course. August 4th, 2024 is our annual Jam for the Lamb. That's our biker hot rod show. And we have, those of you who've been here, you know it's, it's a pretty big deal. All morning and afternoon, we have live music and there's food and drinks and there's a bike show and a car show. And, and uh, this is after following the morning worship service and uh, this year's uh, guest speaker is Bob Duco. He's a WMUZ talk show host there and uh, our theme for this year and the message that day will be America's Christian heritage. So that there's nothing is a better fit for us here in, at this place than that message and we certainly want to welcome everyone and um, I, re I really do recommend you come early on that Sunday if you want a seat inside the room there. So God bless you and thank you for that. Okay, so 
This time we're going to go before the Lord in prayer as we open the service. I have a couple of prayer requests here I'm going to share with you. I have uh, Barb from Jackie Wilson. I have uh, Kimberly Bailey here. Uh, Russ and Anita Harper from Beverly Hansen. Uh, Denny Simon, Steve Allen looks like. Bob, Susan, Donna, Kelly, uh, Dr. Diane B. And for Phil. And that's everything that I have here unless there's something else in the room. Uh, Mark? Chris. Chris. Okay, anyone anyone else? I just got a, a thank you report, really, what it is. Sometimes you don't know who you have around you and can make things happen just by their <coughs> action of what they worked at before and they make it possible to get into an appointment. On the 15th, I have my appointment. They were booked up all the way to September. But through good friends, my appointment was the 15th. So all of you to that. Good for you. You're in good hands. That's exactly right. That's what you say. Absolutely. The best. And we're grateful for that. Absolutely. Good. Todd, you go ahead. Let's pray for our government. Why, whatever would the government need prayer? I'm telling you what. They made Jeff Robon Dean look like a genius. Uh, we, we, might have to, we might have to cancel everything and devote to that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You know, it is very biblical. Pray for your leaders. Governments, governments themselves are the gift of God without which you would have anarchy and chaos. Now, I say government is of God doesn't necessarily mean that all people in government are godly people by any means. But all need prayer. The country, the people, always. So that's a given. Okay, anyone else uh, here before we begin? Okay, so let, let's all gr agree together, and those of you at home, if you'd agree with us, we'd be grateful, and, and uh, let's, let's pray now. Our Father who is in heaven, we are so grateful, so grateful, so glad, and blessed to be among the redeemed here tonight. You've called us, assembled us here just in this moment, in this time, in this place for your purpose. And we ask you to minister to those who are in need, those who have asked specifically. We ask that you would do for them and for us the things that only you can do above and beyond what all of us could even, could even think or imagine. So we're asking for healing, we're asking for comfort, consolation. We're asking for you to intervene in all of our lives in a way that only you can. We all need your help in more ways than we know, but these are all known to you and we, we open our hearts and our lives to you that you may come in and minister to each of us in that special way, in that spiritual way where our, where our burdens are eased and everything is just lifted up where it belongs, into the hands of the Almighty. We're asking that you would bless the remainder of this service and all who are affected or all who are within the reach and jurisdiction of all that we do here this evening in this just brief moment of time that we have. We're asking that you would do the most you possibly could in us individually and collectively, your body, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Let me uh, get situated here. Okay. Going to uh, I'm going to conclude. This is part three of a series that I began a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was titled Superstition and Religion, which is really a play on words. Superstition and religion is a redundancy. Superstition and religion is exactly the same thing. They're interchangeable. And of course, July 3rd, 2024, this is part three. Uh, it could be part 300 and you'd never be done, but, that, but that's true in all cases. The Word of God is infinite. You're never through with it. It's just time to move in a timely fashion. So the question, the question is, is it biblical to believe in the supernatural or the miraculous? Or is this mere superstition? Religion and superstition are both translated from the same word in the Bible. Now I want you to get the impact of that. Mark, would you do me a favor? I hate to ask, I forgot. Would you get my other Bible that's in the other room? Every time I'm in the other room, that Bible's in this room. And I'll trade you all 25 of these Bibles just for that one if you'll bring. But I want you to get the impact of that. We know, I'm sure we know, that the Bible originally was not written in English. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> this was a while ago. At the, the original text of the Word of God, mainly in the Old Testament, was written in the Hebrew language, mostly. And the New Testament was written mostly in Greek and, uh, and some Aramaic and some Latin, but mostly Greek. None of it in English. There was no English yet. There was no England yet. We have that, right? Absolutely. So what that means is, and I don't want to burst your bubble, that means there couldn't possibly have been a King James Bible anywhere near the Apostle Paul or any of these people. I'm not making light of that. It's been the greatest gift to mankind except for Jesus himself. I don't know how many I have. And it still is as good, it is an extraordinarily good, excellent translation. I'm not throwing off on it. But what I'm saying is you need perspective when you read the Word of God. There can only be, by definition, one original of anything. That's what original means. Even the second copy of the same language is not an original. Thanks, Mark. And every, every language, every language of men and of angels, as the Bible says, no matter what language it is, is limited. There are only so many words, there are only so many things that can be said, there are some things that can't be said. No language can say all things at all times perfectly. There's no such thing. That's, that's not even close to definition of language. So every language is limited and incomplete in the sense of things that are inexpressible in other languages. So no language is perfect and complete in and of itself. Now, take an imperfect, incomplete language, anyone, and now translate it into another different incomplete language, whatever it might be. In our case, maybe from the Greek to the English. The Greek is not perfect. 
The English is not perfect, so now you have an imperfect translation being translated into another different imperfect translation. But due diligence has certainly over the years become obvious without a doubt in these translations that the truth itself has been maintained beyond any question. So it's not reason to be concerned there. But what is my point in this is there are some things that are just beneath the surface and require a little bit of study and may not be as they appear to be on the surface all the time in the English language. For example, uh, this is just off the top of my head, in the Old Testament there, the, uh, the Hebrew children, the Israelites, I should say, the, the children of Israel, they were called the peculiar people of God. Now, if someone calls you peculiar, <laughs> if you're like me, you probably answer to that immediately. <laughs> but peculiar then meant purchase possession. Peculiar now means weird or odd. Uh, so, so be careful how you start a new religion <laughs> over a word <laughs> until you find out. So I'm saying as Bible students, which we all are, of course, that's why we're here and what we're doing. Uh, it's important to get just beneath the surface. So on this, on this one theme verse here in the, the book of Acts, we're going to get to it in a second. We have this one word that Paul uses in the King James. It says one thing in another translation is translated another way, etc., etc. But religion and superstition, particularly, those are the words we're picking on tonight. Religion and superstition are both translated from the same word in the Bible. So if you had a Greek New Testament, you would find this word. And now if you translate this Greek New Testament into different translations in English, these different translations would be translated into different words. But the original word was the same. So the meaning is constant, isn't it? Okay, so it's the same word translated different ways depending on the context or the uh, translators. But here's the main point any religious practice i don't care what it is i don't care what church it's in so long as it's a christian church that's what we're talking about any religious practice apart from faith in jesus christ is nothing but superstition fallacy and deception if it does not originate in Christ, focus on Him and come from Him and begin and end with Him. If it's not about Christ, then it is not legitimate Christianity. It is not truth. It is superstition. You can practice religion all you want and all you'll do is die trying to accomplish something you never will. So, Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. All religion, all world religions, who do not originate, continue, and end in Jesus Christ and nothing else. Every one are false, superstitious, and deceptive. They are impotent. They have no power to save, only to condemn. I can't stress that enough. Jesus Christ, Christ only. Okay. Faith is not hoping God can. Faith is knowing that God will. 
Hebrews 11.1, 1, the definition of faith, if you want a definition. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is, everything else is not. Superstition is not. There's no power to it other than a false, counterfeit, sometimes occult type power. So we're just going to quickly slide through these. I know you guys have seen most of this, but maybe some of you haven't. And uh, this is on record. You can go back and get it, or I can get it to you anytime you want. And for the, for the final time here for a while, I want to read this one theme verse or passage that is so rich, it would be worth our time to congregate and sit down and just read this passage. And we would say, we are blessed and worthwhile. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Paul's address uh, on Mars Hill. King James says Mars Hill in Athens, Greece. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. There's the word, religious. The King James Bible right there says, I, I can see that you're too superstitious or very superstitious. So the words are the same, they're just translated different. The King James was published the last version, there were a couple of different versions, but the 1611 version of, of the King James Bible that you have and I have and we have here was 413 years ago when it was published. So God hasn't changed, the truth hasn't changed, but the English language changes every five minutes. So in 400 years, a lot has changed, okay? So that's what we're saying. Verse 23, Paul said, For as I walked around and examined your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship as something unknown, I now proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples made by human hands nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation or nationality of men and he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. We're going to mention this again later. This is the... Uh, sovereignty of God. He chose, we didn't choose who we would be. We didn't choose when we would be born or where. God sovereignly chose these things for us. He knows. Verse uh, 27. God intended that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Though He is not far from each of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, being offspring of God, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by man's skill and imagination. Although God overlooked the ignorance of earlier times, he now commands all men, all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, that is the man, from the dead. We know who that man is. Absolutely. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to mock him. But others said, we want to hear you again on this topic. At that, Paul left the Areopagus, but some joined him and believed, including Dionysius and the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, 
and others who were with them. Wow, what a passage. How much, look at how much is just in that couple of paragraphs. Wow, Paul comes into this city that's just saturated with every kind of demon worship there is. And he said, I'm here to tell you, every bit of this is superstition. And this one God that you say is unknown, he's the one God that not only you need to know, I'm about to introduce you to him. All the rest of these gods are history now. The one true God has made the scene. Maybe he didn't say it that way, but. Okay. So once again, to get this point across in various translations, the same word is translated too superstitious, very religious, and the Darby translation translates this word worshiping demons, which is the literal translation. This is the worship of demons. So many traditionally held religious beliefs are not based on biblical truths. Often people will believe and repeat things which sound good just because they heard someone else say them. All you gotta do is get it started, everybody will chime in. How do we know if our faith is biblical? It must be written in the Word of God, chapter and verse. Second Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is inspired by God, or literally, the literal interpretation of that is God breathed. From God's own mouth, His own breath. You cannot speak a word without breath. It is your breath that moves across your vocal cords that makes the sound. God speaks and it is. Wow. All scriptures, scriptures inspired by God and is profitable for instruction, uh, reproof, correction, discipline, teaching. But the emphasis is not just all scripture is, but only the scripture is. This is important when we are disciplining people, whether it be little children or maybe there's something else, you know, of adult manner. You have to have scripture. You have to have chapter and verse. And it's very important when you share with people. It's very important to you personally first that you have chapter and verse for everything that you consider a hallmark of your own personal faith. There are plenty of people who believe plenty of things that they've just been told all their life and it sounds good and they're going with it and it may be good, maybe not. Check for chapter and verse. Start there always. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to review that. This is one of my favorite texts. This is Paul to the Corinthians. And this, this is a, as good a phrase as you could memorize if you're looking for one tonight. Be careful not to go beyond what's written. Absolutely. When you start jazzing it up, when you start making it a little bit more, or you start making it fit your sermon <laughs> or your argument or your debate or your denomination or your church or whatever it is when you start that it's a slippery slope christian tradition includes many symbolic reminders of the spiritual realities of our faith there are a lot of things traditionally in any church that are symbolic, a lot of symbolism. When you walk into a church sanctuary almost, in a, well, specific, at least specifically traditionally mainstream church sanctuaries, Im immediately you recognize it, this is a church. The lighting, the stained glass, the candelabras, the, there be the pews, there's something there that identifies, there's something symbolic there. 
okay? And during the service, there will be lots of symbol symbolism, all through, I don't care what it is, whether it be hymnals, whether it be choir robes, uh, whether it be clerical collars, whatever it is, there's a lot of symbolism. It's all good if you, I mean, I'm not saying it's not good, it's part of it. It's the landscape. And not in every church, some are different, and that's okay, it's neither good nor evil, but there's a lot of symbolism is what I'm saying. And during the worship services, there will be lots of traditions, customs, practices, like, uh, you know, we'll stand and sing for a while, and then we sit down and we had you it's pretty predictable after a while what the what the uh, venue is or what the routine might be you could say Absolutely. it's it's the order of services if you want to formally so it's easy to identify but all of these things are impotent in themselves unless they point to or remind us of a spiritual reality. And these are the things that we looked at, and I'm going to go down this list and just check it off here. We've already looked at it in depth. But we mentioned the prayer cloths. Remember? Yep. Uh, the prayer cloths, I have, I have several here that uh, just quickly again, this is this prayer cloth inside here is a reminder of Acts chapter 19 verses 11 and 12 where the Bible says and Paul did extraordinary miracles and then there even the his clothing his aprons I think the King James says uses the word aprons or cloths so this is a cloth that reminds us that Paul performed these extraordinary miracles in that time. When we remember that, then we remember, oh, okay, God is the same yesterday, today, forever. And this remind I forgot about that, now I remember. This is it. That's what it is. And then, of course, there's other scripture texts. But the point is that there's no power in the cloth. If you trust in cloth to heal you, I don't want to say nobody can help you because we can help you. But that's superstition. That's like anywhere else it'd be called a good luck charm. You carry that for good luck. That's not what it's about. There's nothing. This is flannel. This is double... Uh, uh, sided soft cotton flannel is the best you can buy so I know what it is but there's nothing spiritual or supernatural in it and there's no redeeming value in it but when I see it I'm reminded of the miracles that God performs today Hallelujah. okay so that's a reminder to trust in this for healing is superstitious but to be reminded in th that Jesus is the healer bolsters our faith. So you see that, right? Now, you can apply that to everything that there is from here on out. Okay, so the anointing oil. Many times we will anoint people with oil for various things. We may uh, consign them to uh, some, for some form of ministry. We may, they may be sick and we're praying a prayer of faith for their healing. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons to do this. But the oil itself, while it's good, is not redeeming. The oil reminds us of the healing power of the Holy Spirit. And then in James chapter 5, we're not going to read this for time, but uh, James says, for any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, anoint with oil, a prayer of faith, will raise him up or will uh, bring healing. But it's not the oil that brings the healing. But it's the oil that reminds us that the Holy Spirit is the healer. 
Communion, same thing. I want to I want to mention that specifically tonight because, of course, we're having it this Sunday. The communion reminds us all of these are symbolic. These are symbolisms. The communion reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice for us and also His return. His sacrifice was not only for our sins, but for our souls as well. Absolutely. It is unfortunate that many Christians never get past the sin issue and that's their sin conscious. Most preachers are more sin conscious than anything else. It's a slam dunk if you bring a list of sins into the church on Sunday and there's nobody there can escape. You got them. I mean, you're going to win every time and they're going to cheer you on and come back next week for more. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but it's human nature. But the sins are just the branch of a tree that needs, <laughs> that needs to be uprooted. It's the tree that's evil in the beginning and now. Jesus said the ax needs to be laid at the root of the tree. You can flail away at the branches all you want. They get thicker and stronger the more you do it. But anyway, the communion, the two elements of the communion are the bread and the wine. The bread, Jesus said, represents his broken body, his body broken for us. His broken body brings healing for our broken body. His broken body makes our bodies whole. The cup of the wine, in our case, it's grape juice, is for the washing of sins, the cleansing of our conscience. So the bread and the wine make us whole on the outside by the bread and on the inside by the cup. And not only that, I don't want to spend the whole evening on this, although it would be a great evening. We all do this together, reminding us and demonstrating to us the importance and the necessity of belonging to his body. He is the head and from the head flows all life. Hallelujah. Healing, strength, you name it. So we eat from the same loaf, drink from the same cup. We are one. Right. It brings us in not just fellowship with him, but in fellowship with one another. Hallelujah. One body and beyond and also it's a reminder he told them that it saddened them when he said i will need to go away but i will be back and in the meantime the comforter the holy spirit will come he will speak of me he will reveal these things to you in my absence it's going to be better then than now they didn't believe that of course because they they couldn't stand that they couldn't bear the thought of him leaving them after what they'd been through together. But think only in these practical terms and you'll see his point. No matter what, Jesus, while he was on the earth, was one man, the Son of Man, at one place doing one thing at a time. That's right. So to all you so-called multitaskers out there, you think, you think you're a multitasker? Once again, you are wrong. Jesus, Jesus never multitasked. 
He moved quickly <laughs> from one to another. But when Jesus was out of town, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus died. What did they say? The first thing they did was jump on him. Jesus, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. <laughs> See if you'd have been here. But he can't be at two places at once. But the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He is everywhere at once. He is God. God is omnipresent. There's nowhere He is not. David said, even if I make my bed in hell, there's God. There's nowhere you can go <laughs> to escape omnipresence of God. So that's a remarkable, remarkable um, drama there. So he did say he would be returning. And he had everything that he had mapped out for them as far as kind of a sketch um, of what, would, what they would expect in the future came to pass exactly like he said. Even though it was kind of fuzzy to them at the time, as it unfolded, they realized it and they remembered as they went, oh yeah, he did say that. Oh yeah, I remember now. He promised. Okay, so water baptism. It's another uh, tradition of the church. It's another uh, religious practice. Water baptism, generally speaking, in most mainstream Christianity is one of the two main ordinances of the church along with communion. Communion, water baptism are two ordinances that are practiced in almost any Christian church you go to. It varies from denomination to denomination. It varies, you know, from week to week, from country to country, but it's there. They're, they're New Testament ordinances. They're called ordinances or practices, if you will. So water baptism is symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, you saw the water there in the, on the slide there at the beginning. It's a tank of water. That represents a watery grave, literally. So Jesus died. After you die, you put in the grave. And then after the grave, you're raised up again. So this is what, this was typical uh, symbolically. So when a person is water baptized, we follow Christ in the waters of baptism, his example. We practice the same ordinance that he did. When we do that, we are announcing to the world, this is your profession now. This is public. You're announcing to the world, the whole world, you're announcing to heaven and to hell that we have chosen to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for the rest of our lives. This is, this is our official coming out. We're, I mean, we're out of the closet. Okay, so from that day on, you're not embarrassed, you're not ashamed. The secret is that it doesn't matter now. You're on record and you're glad to do it. You're so happy. Okay, Mark 16. Let me just meet, uh, speak on this for a second because we are baptizing this Sunday. And I have just volumes that I would love to share in, in three or four hours, but just a couple of minutes here. Mark 16, 15, and Jesus said to them, the, to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So now, you know if I said whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, you'd say, amen. Jesus said that. 
You also know if I said, whoever believes and is baptized and goes to church and sings hymns and studies the Bible, you'll be saved. No. But you would. Of course you would. That's what a Christian does. You believe, and then you're baptized. You're saved, right? Okay, now when you go to church, you're not suddenly not saved, are you? So you're a saved person going to church, right? You're a saved person going to church, reading your Bible, right? You're a saved person reading your Bible, singing hymns. Yes. So you see by extension where we are. And you can add as much as you want. Maybe, you know, you go to Bible study. You, you know, you teach Sunday school. You can add all you want to that list. That's a list of a saved person. But at the head of the list is where the person is saved. All these other things are the result, the fruit of, the practice of, the, by extension, of a saved person. Okay? Now, and then there's a qualifying phrase here. But, whoever does not believe, there's no use talking about baptizing. There's no use talking about going to church and studying your Bible and singing hymns he hasn't believed and whoever doesn't believe is condemned all over the place john said he who believes in the son is not condemned but he who does not believe in the son is already condemned this is clear surely we couldn't misunderstand that so what is it that that removes condemnation from us. It's our belief. It's our belief. So what I, well, I don't want to spend too much on this time, there's always the classic question by the person who probably is not going to heaven anyway. <laughs> they want to argue how to get there and they ain't probably not even going. I hope that's wrong for their sake. That, you know, you're always going to have this religious expert. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. And then you've got these other religious experts. You have to be baptized to be saved. Neither one of them have any idea what they're talking about. If baptism has anything to do with being or not being saved, then what planet are we on? Why crucify Christ if a hole of water can save people? And what about the unlucky guy who dies before he makes it to the water hole? See, don't be silly. If you can find it, if it's not absolutely airtight, it's not the truth. If there's an exception, if there's a loophole in your doctrine, if you can punch a hole in anything I say, bring it to me quick because I need to know now. We'll fix that. If you don't have an airtight gospel, all you got is what your denomination spoon fed you and trained you to say like a parrot somewhere. Okay, we'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. Water is symbolic also, not only of oil, but of many things. Water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy, the Holy Spirit. If you trust in the water, it's superstition. If you trust in God, it's faith. 
to trust in water to save you or help save you or to finish saving you. Water is H2O. It's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and other stuff you don't want to know about. When we now have the natural elements of this earth saving our soul, well, we really got something going now. There's a lot of religions that love to have you. You'd, you'd be a good fit. But not in Christianity. Christianity is a spiritual kingdom. You're born into it spiritually. And eternity will keep you in your spirit, man, forever. There's no, if you trust, if you all these things we're talking about, oil and water and, and different rituals and communion and baptism and all, all these things. If you trust in any one of these whatsoever, in any measure, to just help you be saved. You have missed the whole gospel 100%. You didn't hear a thing. You need to be born again of the Spirit of God right now. This is a 100% spiritual experience. It is a spiritual birth. Rebirth is spiritual. It's not ritual. You hear me? All right, let's move on. Acts 1 and 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now this gets back to what Jenny asked that question about. And I'm not, we have no plans to get into it tonight, but I have it whenever the opportunity comes. John, this is a, Jesus talking about John. He said John's baptism... He only baptized with water for repentance. That's all he could do. What else could he do? Nobody's even a Christian yet. I mean, John, John is baptized. John don't have long either. But he's baptizing with water for repentance. Jesus, that's all Jesus said. But in a few days... The implication is, and we know, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He added the fire. Amen. John didn't have fire to add, and when we do that teaching, you'll know why. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance means 180 degree, about face, turn from this way and go the other way. You're going the wrong way, turn around. Go the right way. That's all it means. It's a military term. It's about face. If you've ever been in a marching band or in the military or anything like that, I bet you'll never forget that. <laughs> about face. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance is prerequisite to believing. You have to repent, then believe. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. After the arrest of John, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God. Now, what is the gospel? The time is fulfilled, he said, and the kingdom of God is near. Here's the gospel from Jesus' own lips. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, Repent and believe. If you, Repent means turn. Believe means turn from what you've been believing in. Repent or turn from what you've been trusting in. All the things that you've been practicing for righteousness sake. Turn from all those things and now turn to the gospel of God which is Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Hallelujah. Salvation is by grace through faith. Right. Righteousness does not come by law. 
but by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, repent from trusting in your church to save you. Repent if you're a Catholic, if you believe the Catholic Church is your salvation. Repent if you're a Lutheran. Repent if you're a Pentecostal. Repent, whoever you are, if you're trusting anything, any church, any institution, or any person on this planet, on earth, if you trust in any of these, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ instead and be saved. Hallelujah. Turn from all that. You cannot add to that. The problem with the Jews were they wanted to add Jesus to Moses. They love Moses. We'll take Jesus too. We like him too. We want them both. When you take them both, you get neither. When you add Christ, when you add grace to the law, you have neither law nor grace. Period. Law or grace excludes works, Paul said to the Galatians. You foolish Galatians, you are bewitched. Who bewitched you into believing this? Grace excludes all works of the law for righteousness sake. Grace is the gift of God 100% from God through Christ. You cannot have it any other way nor means except believing and trusting Christ for it. Nothing else, nothing plus. So Acts chapter 8, just four verses there. Maybe I will read it since we're already close. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Then Philip, this is a, Philip is a, well, he's reading verse 32. Well, see, he's right. <laughs> it's the whole chapter in a minute. It starts at verse 26. Philip, uh, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go south to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Have you heard that lately? Yep. Okay. Philip's been there. So he started out, this is verse 26 or 7. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official in charge of the entire treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his return was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. It's a great story. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, said to Philip, Go over to that chariot and stay by it. So Philip ran up and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him on the chariot. The eunuch was reading his, this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Of course, we know that was Christ. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can recount his descendants? For his life was removed from the earth. Tell me, said the eunuch, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with this very scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He explained that Isaiah was talking about Jesus the, the, the Messiah. As they traveled along the road and came to some water, the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is there to prevent me from being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Somewhere along the way, when Philip was explaining to him what he should do, in response to this gospel that he had just explained to him. Part of that was, you should be baptized. So, next thing you know, here's a, here's a hole of water. And the Philip said, why not right here? I mean, the eunuch. He said, you, okay, here's what he said. Oh, he, he, and he went down in, in the water and baptized him. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, 
the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. He was translated or raptured. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. This is a happy man. He just got saved, baptized. He knows Jesus. He knows the man. He's had Philip here. He watched Philip disappear, right? <laughs> but Philip appeared at Azotus and traveled through that region, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Okay, so, so part of that gospel included being baptized and the eunuch was he was just wide open because the spirit had prompted him and prompted philip to go to him that's why it's so important the bible says be ready to give an answer to those that ask you about your faith why why are you not worried like the rest of us why are you worried about the economy why are you worried about the inflation why are you worried about the covid why are you worried about these things why aren't you worried like the rest of us there's no use saying oh i don't care give them the word this is the time for the word what did philip do he taught the scriptures from the scriptures he told them about jesus christ be ready that's why i'm saying People will cross your path every day if you just have this little thing right here. And we just give them to you. Just give them to you anytime and they just lay there. If, if you had them, the Lord would remind you and bring people across your path. You could just hand them one. You wouldn't have to speak. You could just say, here you go and walk on. So remember that. I'll give you these after service for a modest fee. <laughs> Zero, is that modest enough? Okay, so three prerequisites we see them here with the eunuch and Philip. Number one, you gotta have water. Number two, do you believe? You gotta have faith. He said, do you believe, do you understand, do you believe this? I do believe, he said. Okay, and then a willingness to walk a new walk. Absolutely. You're not doing this. This is not some magic thing you're going to do and it's going to save you so you can go on about your merry way. You will die in your sins and go straight to hell if you are trusting in water or anything other than the person of Jesus Christ and your life laid down before Him. Period you will be lost you can own the church you can be the head of the church you can be the pope you can be the the head of the biggest denomination ever unless you are born again of the spirit of god based in your 100 percent surrender of your life to pick up the life of jesus christ and identify with him in your heart, in the deepest part of your being, you will never see the inside of the kingdom of God. I don't care how many times you get baptized or how many communions you take or how many churches you join, you will die lost without Jesus Christ right here. Okay. Okay. Dedication of children. We practice that, don't we? Dedication of children to the Lord without parents dedicating themselves to the Lord is pure superstition, folly, and unbelievably hypocritical. Luke chapter 2, if you want to read it, that's where Jesus was taken to the temple as a young child at the right time according to the law of Moses. And he was dedicated to the Lord. His life was dedicated to the Lord and the Lord's service. But the parents' lives had been dedicated to the Lord in order to do that. Here's where this magic comes in again. There's people that never come to church. They have a baby. Oh, I want my baby dedicated. They, they've never been inside the church. They come. They get that magic ceremony. Away they go. Better listen. I hope this gets to you, some of you. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers... Bring your children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Teaching them right from wrong. Don't tell me that teaching right from wrong. 
That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You have certainly condemned them if that's all you got. These children have to have the Spirit of God in order to be saved the same as you. Nobody's saved by right from wrong. Right from wrong is what has condemned humanity forever apart from the blood of Jesus. How about church weddings? Oh boy, they're magic too, aren't they? <laughs> you get a church wedding, you got it, man. Yeah. They are totally hypocritical unless the couples and the marriage are committed to Christ. Invite Christ to your wedding first. How about that? Yeah. Amen. Before you get too drunk to remember it, commit your life to Jesus Christ. You claim you love this person. Everybody gets married. We love each other. We got to be married. In six months, they got a lawyer. Before you marry anybody, be married to Christ. Amen. Or you got no chance. And if you happen to manage to stay under the same roof until you die and end up in hell, what? How smart are you? It's about Jesus Christ. It's always about Him. Everything is about Him. I said that in the beginning. Every single thing that we do here focuses on, comes from, and ends up with the person of Jesus Christ and everything else is a sacrilege and foolishness and don't waste my time. Okay. Hebrews 13.4 Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Absolutely. I said marriage is an honorable institution. God said it is, it is. That's right. I said this lately. Maybe I uh, might have phrased it differently had I had time to think. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. When you t if, if you ever tell me marriage is just a piece of paper, no. I'm not going to say again what I already said once. You're too stupid for me to waste my time on you. <laughs> you ain't fit to be married to nobody. You need to be in kindergarten in diapers somewhere. <laughs> if that's all you know, you certainly don't know enough to be a married man or a married woman. Other than that, how about fate, fatalism? We studied it. How about this? When I say that, I mean this. It was meant to be. If, you, if, you, if you've been saying that, don't say that. It was meant to be is not a Christian precept. It is a widely held belief in Hinduism and a key principle in Islam, meaning the will of Allah. It's like half the Christians run around talking karma, karma this and karma. They, they wouldn't know a Bible if they saw one. You're going to think karma. It was meant to be. You were meant to be smarter than that. You want some meant to be? There's your son. It is never meant to be that someone should die lost. Men are free moral agents with power to choose their destinies. Every sane human being has control over their eternity. Not even God overrules your word. You have the last word. Not God. You. If you say no to God, it's no. If you say yes, nobody can keep you out. You say no, nobody can get you in. Man has the last word by, his, by rejecting or embracing his Savior. 2 Peter 3 9 is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What comes after repentance? Believe. Divine providence, not fatalism. 
not it was meant to be. But divine providence refers to the sovereign acts of God. One good example we just read, Acts 17, 26, from one man, and there's a false D there, from one man, God made every nation or nationality of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and He determined their appointed times and He determined the boundaries of their lands. That's the divine, sovereign act of God. That's providence. The other one that we looked at last week was from Psalm 139, I think, where the Bible says, God knew me before I was. He knew me when my, when I, when my body was yet unformed in the womb. He knew my, my days were in His book before there were days. Sovereign, divine providence of God. Not it was meant to be. Okay, at least be Christian. Okay, how about this? God is in control. <laughs> right there with you, Larry. Well, would you mind qualifying it in control of what? <laughs> What's he in control of? Tell me. Everything? He battered the man over the earth, so we are in control. Do you know what a concordance is? It's a it's a reference book that goes with the Bible. Whatever translation you have, mostly uh, if you. Most people have King James Bible. There's a Strong's Concordance, King James Bible. And in a Strong's Concordance, it has every word that's in the King James Bible every time it's used, everywhere. So see if you can find that phrase in there. God is in control. And if you can't find it there, check your Facebook friends. You'll probably find it there. You'll find it there, I'm sure. This one goes around a lot on Christian Facebook. One says it, then all their friends start saying, God's in control. Something bad happens, earthquake, God is in control. People get killed, God's in control. Plague comes, God is in control. That's the best you can do? In control of what? Of this planet? Have you looked lately? <laughs> if this is control, I hate to see it out of control. They're going to see it out of control. They haven't yet. All right. God delegated control to man. Is that all right? Until man forfeited it right. or abdicated it to the devil. Yeah, that's right. Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2. God made everything, 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 describes it this and that and then verse 15 in chapter 2 he says then the Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it he was the keeper of the garden so who's the first one that shows up right after this how about the serpent yep. he sure did. who's supposed to be keeping this garden Adam. and now you let now that now there's a serpent in the garden what did you think was going to happen so we know what happened catastrophe and then finally Jesus who was promised a little while after the serpent 
got past the gatekeeper. Jesus took it back. What Adam threw away. It's in Matthew 28. He gave it back to man. Matthew 28. This, this slide will definitely finish it. This is the so-called Great Commission. Uh, verse 18. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, Listen up. All authority in heaven and on earth. What was the first two things that were created? In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, all nationalities of people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, Everything was as it should be. When God made everything, it was very good. And then he handed it to the man, perfect. He said, now, if you pay attention here, do what you're told, no problem. Of course he didn't. Now problem. Everything a moment ago is gone forever. Now everything a moment later is exactly the opposite, totally different than what it was a moment ago. Where there was fellowship in, in, uh, in the cool of the day with his maker, a moment later, he's afraid and scared and naked and running and hiding and lying and making excuses and all kinds of things. Just a moment ago, he had no idea of any of this and something else got inside of him okay let me finish this and you can get your call there <laughs> so what is the truth let's just overlay it with this if you want a good one to leave on this is a good one yes. jeremiah 29 11 for i know the plans i have for you I don't care what kind of plans everybody else has got. The plans that the Lord has for you is what matters. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That's right. A lot of people don't believe that. They're still afraid he might at any time. He might pay them back because they're so, uh, you know, behave so poorly. If God starts paying people back, then I got a problem. Why did you murder Christ? And you're going to murder me too for the same sin. No rational person can accept that. My plan is to give you hope and a future. Yes. You worried about your future? You don't have any hope? You are not hopeless. You are not without hope. You're not without a future. Your future is a guarantee. It is a certainty. It's already described in graphic detail. My, for thousands of years, why are you worried? Why do you feel you're in trouble? You, you, you won't have enough. Why are you so negative when the joy of the Lord is our strength. Do all that you know to do. Be wise. Be prudent. Be studied. Don't be lazy. If you're lazy, you're going under. I'll tell you that now. Not even God can help a lazy man. 
But if you're doing what you can, trust in the Lord and stand. And don't ever fear. And don't ever, don't ever let them see you sweat. And don't whine. If this is your last day, let it be. But you stand, but you stand tall in, in the Lord. That's right. His plan for you is good. We are not afraid. We are bold in Him. Amen? Amen. Sunday, communion, water baptism, 11 o'clock if you know what you're doing. God bless you and thank you for now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Russ.